State Minister, Ms. Grütters, Ambassador Lauda, Ambassador Eisenstadt, Ms. Kinwill, representative of the American ambassador, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome in the House of World Cultures. This house is an independent art and cultural organization which is financed by the Minister of State for Culture and the Media. We develop our products, our projects independently. In exceptional cases, we also rent our premises, and today is such an exception. The history of this location is deeply linked to the spirit of the Washington principles. Let me explain it a bit. In 2015, we had Maria Eichhorn do a cultural project which was based on a large-scale archive research. The aim of the project was to establish the ownership relations during and before the Nazi period of the location where the Congress Hall is now. We had an urban landscape there that was very much defined by Jewish life. Some of the property we're on today was owned by Magnus Hirschfeld, the famous sexual researcher. He re did not return back from a trip to the United States and indeed died in exile. His clinic in 1933 was plundered by students. The library was destroyed in the burning of books. This, the artwork in 1963 was passed over to us and after this it was used by the health authorities. After the, this period, it went back to the trusteeship as a restitution project. After Berlin went to court, there was an agreement with which the state of Berlin took on this property, and we have a memorial to, to Hirschfeld that refers to this. The Heimann family, a Jewish family, also owned some of the property when in 1918 her husband died, Ms. Charlotte Heimann inherited the property. The regulation was such that if the property was sold, the three sons would have to be paid out. The three Heimann sons left Germany in 1933, but since from 1933 operating a hospital was no longer allowed to Jewish owners, and thus Kurt Penny became the director. He was the former accountant. Kurt Penny took on three further Jewish hospitals, and by the end of the war, he owned impressive amounts of property and a great deal of money. Penny bought the property because due to the laws that were in place, then Ms. Hyman, who had to live on money sent to her from her brother and could no longer retain the property. 150,000 Reichsmarks were supposed to be paid. In 1943, Charlotte Heimann was sent to Auschwitz-Birkenau. We do not know her actual date of death, but the property of the three sons who fled was confiscated by the Gestapo. And after the war, in 1951, son made a restitution claim. The result was a lengthy legal dispute with Kurt Penny in which this, first, this person, first of all, questioned the right of the sons to own it and then said that the property was defective in order to make the low level of money paid seem acceptable. In the end, only 1,540 Deutschmark was paid to them. The conditions that forced Charlotte Heimann to sell, which was exclusively due to the Nazi regime, was not something that the chamber ruling on this accepted. Thus, the sale to Kapemni was considered acceptable. The result was a settlement of Pelni and the three sons for 3,000 Deutschmarks. Then, 
Kupani sold this for 53,900 to the state of Germany. The Congress Hall was allowed to be built. It was planned as an architectural symbol of freedom from the post-fascist democracy in West Berlin. The tension between the different historical dimensions of this background was the conclusion which led to the House of World Culture pursuing its mandate the way it does. So on this note, I wish you every success over the next two days. Your Excellencies, dear colleagues, MPs from the various parliaments, including the German National Parliament, dear Stuart Eisenstadt, dear Ronald Lauder, Mr. Lupfer, as the Honorary Chairman of the German uh, Center for uh, cultural loss, dear Mr. Patzinger, as president of the uh, foundation, which is uh, Im Im very important for this particular event, um, namely for the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation, the college who, a colleague who represents the Cultural Foundation of the German States. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, but above all, let me welcome those survivors of the Holocaust who are with us, dear relatives and descendants of the many people who had to suffer unmentionable pain through the Holocaust. In 1903, Albert Martin Wolfson, a Jewish collector, bought an Adolf Menzel drawing entitled The Interior of a Gothic Church, one of 32 drawing sheets for which he paid altogether 50,000 Reichmark in 1903. In 1938, his daughter Elsa Cohen had to sell these drawings in order to finance her escape from the Nazis into the United States. Hildebrand Gullit was the man who purchased this. His accounts state he paid 150 Reichmark a hand drawing of Menzel at that time certainly would have commanded a different price. In 2017, finally, the Wolfson family was returned its property thanks to the Schabinger Kunstfund Task Force. Last February, I was able to hand over these drawings to Elsa Cohen's descendants. With her biography, Elsa Cohen embodies the fate of many of the people who suffered a similar fate. And in the Gropius building, there is an exhibition on the Gurlitt collection dedicated to what happened to such art collected in the Nazi time. This is an illustrative example for the successes that can be made in this area from international academic cooperation. The German-Israeli cooperation in, in particular is to be uh, appreciated particularly here, not just for historical reasons, but for others as well. That is why it's only logical that this uh, exhibition uh, in a revised form will also be shown in Israel as well as, I hope at least, in other countries. It has already been seen in Bonn, Bern and Berlin. Berlin. In the first three decades of the 20th century, Berlin was the hub of the European art world, and legendary collectors like Alfred Flechtheim or Paul Cassira contributed to that with their enthusiasm for this artistic avant-garde and its widespread network. Many of those collectors, most of them were Jewish, and during the National Socialist reign of terror, they lost their property. The National Socialists persecuted them, they were looted, they were expropriated. Others, like Elsa Cohen, had to sell what they owned 
far below their actual value and leave it all when they escaped into immigration. This suffering, this injustice, is not something which can be made good again, never. Despite this, I consider it to be an important, a very meaningful gesture to hand back these mental drawings to Elga Cohn's descendants, and in, thus, in this way, I was able to contribute in a minute way to some historical justice being given. It was very moving to me because it became so tangible in this event that behind every work of art that was confiscated, there is the individual destiny of a human being. Recognizing this, telling the public about this, that's something which we owe to the victims of National Socialist terror and their descendants. I am grateful that some of them have again made their way to Germany. And once again, let me welcome you most warmly. It is you, the descendants, the survivors, who with your own narratives have made it possible to approach what is so inexplicable. When you talk about it, what happened in the Holocaust is more than a chapter in a history book. It becomes confronting the very inhumanity that people are capable for and which therefore are important to every single one of us on a personal level. That is an insight which we need in order to live up to the responsibility which we will permanently have vis-a-vis -vis the victims. It is due to the insufferable pain that we gave to the victims. And the NS um, looted art, which was a part of the NS war machinery, it is up to us to research this, to obtain clarity whatever possible, and then to obtain fair and amicable solutions with the descendants that still exist. And that is what the Washington Conference was all about. 20 years ago, in December 1989, this conference was held. And a symbol of this are the so-called Washington Principles and the joint declaration where the German federal government, the German states, and the local and municipal organization all commit to implementing these Washington principles. They are still the guideline for what we do today. And today, together with the German Foreign Office, I will sign a joint agreement with Stuart Eisenstadt and Thomas Eskedi, the Special Missionary of the United States, for questions pertaining to the Holocaust. And this joint declaration will again reconfirm our commitment. Dear Stuart Eisenstadt, you initiated this Washington conference 20 years ago. You also um, managed to negotiate the Washington principles. I always have to try and, and look through these other faces and, and lights to see you. You tried to find fair and equitable solutions, and that really was special for the whole world. And it is your achievement that we need to measure against now and today. Uh, Madeleine Albright, the then um, Secretary of State of the United Nations, who, uh, United States, who turned out to be a victim descendant herself, she said it was not something where we can make miracles happen, but still we can do all in our power to change darkness to light, injustice to fairness, conflict to consensus, and lies to truth. That is the very least we have to do. How difficult, long drawn out, and occasionally incredibly difficult it is to find out the providence of a cultural object over decades and to clarify this origin without any doubt is something which the Wolfson Cohn family history is a prime example for. So provenance research is dedicated to this task. And I would like to welcome all provenance uh, researchers from all over the world uh, who are here today, many of them high caliber experts in their field. By setting up special university chairs and junior professorships in the cities of Bonn, uh, Hamburg, Munich, and also soon to uh, be organized in Berlin as well. We've tried to make sure that we anchor provenance research in academia, and I think we're actually making good progress on that. Rest assured, ladies and gentlemen, 
I will continue to follow your work with a great deal of interest. I've been supporting you since I took office to the best of my abilities, last but not least because I am a historian, art historian originally, and many years I've been involved in arranging um, exhibitions in the Max Liebermann building, so in my uh, other life, I was very frequently confronted with such uh, issues. Immediately after took, o took office in 2013, the Gurlitt art uh, discovery gave a new and additional dynamics to this whole issue, which made academia, the public, and the victims of uh, the Nazi persecution sit up and take an interest. And obviously, it did require robust action to be taken. But it's not since then only that we are taking seriously provenance research and working through the Nazi looted art issue. That is not just a political thing for us, it's something which is dear to our hearts, which is why um, the funds for this in my area of res responsibility have almost been quadrupled. But in Germany, we've also improved the, the provenance research. Uh, we set up uh, the German Center of uh, uh, Lost Cultural um, uh, lo uh, cultural losses, with which we've done between the federal government and the state government. Now in Germany, we have a central contact point when it comes to implementing the Washington principles. I also consider it to be uh, something which shows that we have trust in, in what is happening, and we must make sure that the uh, co-organizer of today's um, conference uh, held to commemorate 20 years of the Washington Principles is always the point of contact to come to. Mr. Lupfer, to you and all your team, let me take this opportunity to thank you for your great commitment and to the other cooperation partners of this conference, which is Mr. Fatzinger representing the um, Foundation um, of Cultural uh, Prussian Cultural Heritage and the Cultural Foundation of the German States and the German Federal Cultural Foundation. We're doing what we can. We also want to set up a special um, se setting and, and fund for uh, the research into colonial goods. And here I would like in particular to welcome um, Ms. Seva. But it is still one of our central uh, jobs to look into the restitution of Jewish art. Some of the guiding principles of provenance research are networking and transparency, the public documentation of uh, research, search, found items in a central database has become a great uh, center and source when it comes to implementing the Washington research principles. In addition to the lost item database, we're going to have a special database set up in January 2020, which is going to be a uh, research or search database. And that will make whatever we know known to all the world. The German Center can in this way be a central platform for exchanging uh, provenance research data. And I think that's uh, more than necessary, and I'm very happy to say that we are on the right track with this. Many cultural organizations, in particular the large museums which are supported by um, the German government in whichever guise, are very much aware of their responsibility and are showing great commitment in this job, not least by hiring new staff for provenance research in particular. And again, here we emphasize transparency. Databases on their inventories um, can al already be seen online and have to be made available online. To give you one example, uh, the uh, Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation, for example, with uh, its president who is here, can, can agree uh, that this is so. They've already got 12 million uh, inventory um, items published under SPK, which is the uh, abbreviation of the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation German, more than 600,000 digitized um, finds have already been um, made public online as well. Since cultural institutions in Germany are mainly financed by municipalities, regions, or the federal states, I've also asked my colleagues in the German states to digitize all their institutions and to publish 
their records and their inventories, although many of them have been doing this for some time. In Dresden, we know that they've been doing this, the state collections of uh, the state of Bavaria, the Berlin Gallery, and many others. I can't name them all, particularly because I am responsible primarily for federal institutions. We want to continually improve the framework conditions for research and restitution of um, Nazi art noted in Germany with some examples which we can tell you really is proving effective. And we see this primarily by looking at the number of restitutions which have risen. Since in 1998, 20 years ago, the Washington principles were formulated by until September 2018. As far as known, I mean, not everything is always uh, made public because many of the cases are, are dealt with rather discreetly for very good reasons. But as far as is known, more than 5,700 cultural items have been restituted, more than 11,000 books and other library items as well. And of course, we can only mention those cases that we have knowledge of. We would like to make it possible to get a, a central list um, ab about this. Um, and I can only say for the Lost Cultural Items Organization in Germany, Please, everybody, use this notification center so that we have a bit more knowledge about these statistics, because after all, it's good news. The federal jurisdiction and the fact that restitution has not so far been centrally registered means that the numbers we have so far are incomplete. However, it is clear that many institutions in Germany are really living up to their responsibilities in the res this respect. Against this backdrop, the occasional criticism and the work of um, the uh, Advisory Commission on the return of cultural property seized as a result of Nazi persecution, especially Jews' property, is something I cannot share because it basically shows that many cultural institutions do not need um, this commission, this advisory commission, to, to help them, and they do it themselves. The, the advisory commission is supposed to enter into the fray to achieve an amicable settlement when all other avenues have been closed. Apparently, in a great number of cases, there is no need for this arbitration, and I think that's quite uh, encouraging. Many of the negotiations, partly in order to protect the people involved, are handled in a very unobtrusive and quiet way. And the advisory commission, the way it was set up in December 2016, was set up in this vein. And two Jewish members, Raphael Gross and Gary Smith, were also asked to um, sit on this commission. And that certainly has helped to enhance and improve the work of this body. Of course, despite what has already been achieved, there is no need to lean back and be satisfied. On the contrary, it's absolutely imperative that we keep looking into the effects and consequences of the Nazi regime and to never slacken when it comes to processing its effects. We will always remember that even in Germany today, we've seen anti-Semitic attacks and right-wing extremist trends. And that is why working through the Nazi um, artistic theft and cultural theft is something which I will continue to work on. I think this is important for the future. I am continually exchanging views with many of you in this respect. respect. Ronald Lauder, President of the Jewish Congress, once again, I would like to emphasize you personally, your role, and once again, welcome you. I'm very glad, Ronald Lauder, that you've been giving us so much support. But I'd also like to thank you for being open and even critical. Some improvements have been planned in individual um, matters. Let me tell you what these are. It's something which is personally very important to me that our efforts to return Nazi looted art should always be pushed to be returned to their descendants. I have absolutely no understanding for the fact that even today some institutions funded by public money uh, refuse to work with the advisory commission. I lack all understanding for that. And that means all museums receiving public funds, that is the museums uh, I can access, and other cultural institutions will be um, obliged from next year onward when contacted by the advisory commission should uh, they uh, receive queries from possible claimants. They have to take those seriously and follow them. Uh, we can do this uh, because otherwise there can be sanctions levied 
bearing in mind we fund the institutions. As far as private owners are concerned, owners of collections, private institutions, I can only appeal to all of you, please do not close yourself off to these matters, but act in accordance with the Washington principle. So this is an appeal to all private collectors, institutions, and museums. The moral responsibility for dealing with the consequences of Nazi looted art is not something which rests only with the state, it, its institutions. Private collectors and also the private art dealers, I think, with all due respect for what has been achieved, more commitment can indeed be asked of this private sector. Secondly, people occasionally cons express concern that for budgetary reasons, uh, we might not be able to return such limited art. And this is why I work with the Ministry of Finance in Germany, and we've agreed that we will clarify this at the national level and we'll make sure that for museums and other institutions uh, of a cultural nature, uh, which are liable and subject to budgetary law in Germany, there are absolutely no um, restrictions which would preclude them from returning um, art proven to be looted art or stolen art. Many of the issues are also um, problems with confiscation. It starts with the fact that victims of the Nazi regime or their descendants find a language barriers what they account or uh, the German federal system, which is anything but easy to deal with, uh, is yet another obstacle for them. In addition, the museum landscape in Germany is extremely diversified, making it difficult to find the right personal institution to contact. And uh, Ronald Lauder has suggested that we should set up, and I will happily agree with that, set up a help desk, which would be a central point of contact for every possible climate. Giving, claimant, giving them help and orientation. Because I would like to see that the people themselves or those whose ancestors have already suffered unspeakably in Germany and by German hands should not suffer more obstacles, that they should feel understood and that they receive help. Fourthly, there are of course cases where a potential claimant is not aware of his or her claim. Provenance research has uh, occasionally met some obstacles when it comes to finding a descendants, and they have to do this search. The German Center for um, Lost Cultural Arts is already providing helpful advice on its website, and yet um, the search for descendants may be widely dispo dispersed all over the world, Com can be a very difficult, very cumbersome, very expensive undertaking for collectors, for private individuals. We're happy to help there, and from the next year on, from the DZK, we will try to find material support for um, the um, descendants and heirs. So ladies and gentlemen, you see even such a big event like 20 years commemorating 20 years of the Washington Principles cannot be the final curtain to what we're dealing with. On the contrary, this is a new beginning. And it means that we'll have even more researchers with better tools than before, all still trying to find out the truth. This is one of the objectives of today's conference. And I hope that you will have a very lively exchange here at this conference. And this place, which Mr. Scherer has explained um, because he is the director of the House of World Cultures. It is a venue which was once the uh, U.S. American contribution to the Interbau 1957 International uh, Construction Exhibition, and it was supposed to embody, embody the freedom of uh, an exchange of views. That, I think, is, is a good symbol also for our conference, which will hopefully open up new vistas for what we all share. Even if uh, we can never really repay what was done, but it is necessary to do all that we can in order to find out what was done by the Nazis, because every single cultural or artistic object which value can be decided and which may also be restituted is one jigsaw in an as yet incomplete historical picture. We need to add to this wherever we can, and we need to recognize its truth. This is something which we owe to the people who were expropriated, who were 
had their property, often their lives, taken away by the National Socialists. And so this conference is a warning to us. And we have to remember and process all the many terrible facets of the Nazi dictatorship. Never again must Germany be a country where hatred, incitement against violence or to violence or incitement against minorities will find an echo, neither at schools or open places, not in mosques nor in concert halls. Remembrance and information, giving attention to the time where National Socialist Germany destroyed millions of people, destroyed the dignity of man in the most basic way. That time can give us a lot of information about the ideology, and this memory can sensitize us for those who prepare the ground for this ideology, this totalitarianism. We see a brutality of language gaining ground. We see that people try to talk down the scale of the national socialist crimes. There is silence, either because people were cowardly or because they didn't care. This is what we need to know. The German government acts in the full knowledge of the permanent responsibility of Germany when it comes to processing the crimes committed against humanity by the National Socialists to keep that memory alive and to work with all our strength to combat anti-Gypsyism, anti-Jewism, Jewish sentiments and all such modes. And it is in this way that we will try to further develop this area. And I would like to say I wish this very valuable conference all possible success. Thank you. Good morning. Liebe Frau Dr. Kögelmann, vielen Dank. Uh, Professor Lüpfer, Herr Hütte, auch Ihnen und dem gesamten Team des Deutschen Zentrum für Kulturgutverluste danke ich für die Ausrichtung dieser Konferenz. Wir freuen uns über diese einmalige I'm Gelegenheit. About this unique opportunity to take stock of what has been done in the past 20 years and what we have achieved. Minister of State Grutes, I want to thank you for your words and thank you for your strength of leadership in the efforts that Germany is making to give back stolen property and to offer some kind of restitution to victims of the Shoah. It's a privilege to be here with Ambassador Stuart Eisenstadt, who has powered this initiative from the beginning, and also with Ambassador Ron Lauder, President of the World Jewish Congress and Chairman of the Commission for Art Recovery. Your unwavering advocacy inspires us. And I'd also like to recognize my colleague from Washington, who is working on the, these issues, the department's special envoy for Holocaust issues, Tom Yazgerdi, also his deputy who couldn't be with us today, Susan Sandler. Embassy Berlin, in fact, all of Mission Germany, relies on our productive partnership with you, and we know our German colleagues do too, so thank you so much for being here today. I am very encouraged to see so much interest on the part of researchers, scholars, curators, and government officials from a number of countries here today. Now, some of you know, I uh, worked in Berlin before, just a few years ago, so I'm a Wiederholungstäter here. And uh, that means I also remember the discovery of the Gerlit Trove of artwork in Munich just a few years ago. And as the minister said, today, just a few blocks from us, a museum is showing an exhibition dedicated to the Gerlit story. But you know, initially, the reports we heard treated the case as a tax evasion issue in Bavaria. 
but I knew right away that it was so much more than that. Why? Because of the Washington principles. I knew Holocaust survivors and their heirs would wonder what it was in that trove of artwork. Were there works that had once belonged to their families? Transparency would be absolutely essential to ensure that artwork could be seen, claimed, and returned to its rightful owners. This was about so much more than resolving Bavarian tax questions. This was front page news. I'm very happy to say that the German government officials that I reached out to at what I will admit now was a very inconvenient hour uh, agreed with me. They too relied on the Washington principles that give us the guidelines we need to resolve questions across national legal systems and to facilitate the location and return of our artwork to Holocaust survivors and their heirs. The United States is committed to upholding religious freedom around the world and working to ensure the return of Nazi confiscated and looted art is an important part of that. Our Congress passed the Holocaust Expropriated Art Recovery Act in December of 2016, allowing claimants to recover works of art that had been subject to previous statutes of limitation. And just last May, the Justice for Uncompensated Survivors Today Act was signed into law. It requires the State Department, us, to provide a report to Congress next fall on the restitution record of every country which associated itself with the 2009 Terezin Declaration. The United States is active, engaged, and pursuing restitution for those whose artwork was seized. But isn't it extraordinary the power that these artworks have over time? It's property, yes, but so much more. Art sparks controversy and criticism. Why else would the Nazi regime have felt the need to classify some works as degenerate? Art sparks imagination and debate about the past and the future. It inspires us to pay over our limit, to fight with our friends and relatives over our choices, to debate what to save in a crisis. In an intangible way, whether it's a Hans Holbein or a Jackson Pollock, works of art help define us. They show us everything from the ravages of war to the challenges of peace. They show us our cities in times of change and the countryside where we seek refuge from chaos. Art holds up a mirror which reflects our societies and institutions. It reflects on the presence or absence of justice in our lives and those of others. Art shows us structures we've built and the values we live by, and they show us ourselves over the generations Portraits are sometimes caustic and critical, but also sometimes they smooth us out and show us the best of ourselves. So a painting is so much more than paint on canvas. That canvas is the fabric of the lives of our ancestors, woven into our own lives. And especially for the Jewish community, Scattered by fleeing the Nazi regime and the Holocaust, art is a vital connection to the past. Artworks are how we tell our story, whether it's of one family or a generation. It brings back the absent. It reconnects us. U.S. Senator John Cornyn said it very well. Artwork lost during the Holocaust is not just property. 
to many victims and their families, it is a reminder of the vanished world of their families. And that's why art survives beyond the moment. It brings us joy, and its loss brings us sorrow. It shows us who we are. Die Vereinigten Staaten setzen sich weiterhin entschlossen zu die Rückgabe the United States of America are still pushing for the restitution of art seized by the Nazis to the original owners and their descendants. Only if we bear in mind at all times just how important it is to remember and to return what has been stolen and to work towards both of these aims every day can we combat anti-Semitism and intolerance where it rears its hoary head. Together, we will plan our progress and will strengthen all countries to help finally allow justice to come to people who have survived the Shoah and their descendants. Thank you for your attention. Mr. Woodhouse, Ambassador Lauder, Ambassador Eisenstadt, Ambassador Vital, dear Colette, my dear colleague Robin, thank you for these words and please remind me next time not to speak after you because they will be sure that we are comparing notes. Ducks, it's all about ducks. I remember being a young child back in Israel and every time my grandmother will take up my sister and myself to visit the local park. And we'll always start at the happiest part of the park, which will be the monkeys. And then we'll be moving probably to the most hyperactive part of the park, which was the Spielplatz. We'll play with the carousels, we'll go to the sandbox. But then was coming the most relaxing probably part of the day for us, at least for me and my sister, when we were crossing on a very narrow bridge, very tiny bridge, above a tiny, tiny canal that was leading to a quiet place of the park, far away in the shadow, far away from this Middle Eastern heavy sun, and seeing over there a small pond with only a few ducks, three, four ducks, not more. And over there, my beloved grandmother somehow will always disconnected from, to be disconnected from us. She was there, physically she was there. But I could see in her eyes that she was only physically over there. Her mind, her soul was someplace totally different. And I was always sure then that it's remind her, her son, my brother's brother, my father's brother, that was killed in the War of Independence. Only four years ago, when I came over here to Germany to start my posting, and I was driving with my wife to Spandau, and we were parking the car next to a small bridge that was crossing the canal towards the Altstadt of Spandau, and I saw ducks basically swimming in the canal beneath us, I realized that what my grandmother was missing, she was missing the place that she was born in. She was missing Germany. When she was going over there, she was trying to recover this very innocent world that she lived in, the innocent world that collapsed in a very brutal way immediately. 85 years ago, my, mother, my grandmother left Magdeburg. Yes, Mr. Lupfer, she left Magdeburg. She and many of her family's members, they left, luckily, early enough. Some of you over here in the crowd, among you, will know them. Menachem Max Pressler, 
the famous pianist that is a honorary citizen of uh, Magdeburg right now, today, or the people that coming from the Clem Conference would know Bubi Pressler, the representative of uh, the Clem Conference in Israel. He was also a nephew of my grandmother. They really left Germany, but Germany never left them. My grandmother always talked to me in German until her last day in, uh, in this world. Every night when we were with her, she would read us, obviously in German, Bruder Grimm stories. Hansel and Gretel was my favorite. Last year, when Minister Gutas was inaugurating the Gurlit collections in Bonn, I was there. And we were surrounded, Robin, you probably saw it over here in the Martin Gropius bar. We were surrounded with those amazing pieces of the leading artists of the world. And I haven't seen anything. I was trying really to look on the drawing and I was not being able to see any of them. All I felt was, was fear and destruction, war, humiliation. So I went back one month later again. I went with my wife, especially from Berlin to Bonn, and I still couldn't see those pieces. All I felt was this destruction and fear. So when you're going to discuss over here, in the next two days, looted art, you're not really talking about looted art. You are talking about looted souls, the souls of our grandmothers. Because when you're going to discuss Riders on the Beach, you're not really going to discuss Max Lieberman. What you're going to discuss is a grandchild in the living room of his grandmother, eight years ago, with his head on her laps, and she is putting her hand on his head. So what I'm asking you to do over here in those couple of days is to adopt the Jerusalem Declaration. I know that we're talking about the Washington one, but I encourage you to adopt the Jerusalem Declaration. Ambassador Vital is going to present it, I think, tomorrow. Right, Avital, uh, Colette? Colette is going to present it tomorrow. Because if those drawings will be hanged at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, when those grandchildren will go and saw those, will see those drawings on the walls, they wouldn't see Max Lieberman, they wouldn't see Matisse or Chagall, they will feel. They will feel their grandmothers standing next to them. They could see them smiling. The smiles that were looted from them eight years ago, 70 years ago, will be back on their faces. And the hands, they will feel the hands on the shoulders. So do the right thing, do the just thing, Adopt the Jerusalem Declaration. Bring back to us our looted grandmothers, the looted smiles, the looted happiness, too many times the looted lives. Thank you very much. Good day and a very warm welcome from me. I'm Shelley Kupferberg. Together with C.V. Kugelmann, I'm going to uh, moderate this conference today and tomorrow. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for the um, welcoming words we heard from Bernd Scherer of House of World Cultures, from Monica Grutters, the Commissioner of the German Government for Culture and Media, and Avraham Nier Feldklein, Richard, uh, Robin Glennell. And I would like to thank the interpreters who have a lot to do these days, and I would like to give their names. Thank you to Lillian Astrid Geyser, Barbara Chisholm, Catherine Johnson, and Songo Benturk. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this conference uh, is set up in four different sections by theme. Twenty years after the uh, Washington principles, we want to take stock 
exchange views, experience, have a discussion about fair and equitable solutions. We're going to talk about how to develop this further, what prospects exist, what are the questions of uh, responsibility. And of course, such an event is always excellent to network, to meet other people. And I hope you will have enough time for that here in Berlin. We are now going to hear some introductory presentations. And I would like to ask the first to come uh, is Ronald Lauder, the founder of the Ronald S. Lauder Foundation, whose name was mentioned several times today. Starting 1987, this uh, foundation has been funding Jewish educational institutions in, in many, many countries, including Germany and Austria. And he's also the chairman of the Art Recovery Commission set up in 1997. And this is the hat he's wearing here today. So once again, also in this capacity, a very warm welcome to you, Ronald S. Lauder. Thank you. We all know why we're here today. We all know what began here in 1933. And we know that we are still trying to sort out the consequences of what happened. What you may not know is why I am here and why I became involved in the topic of Nazi looted art 30 years ago. Please let me explain this with two very personal stories. The first took place in New York City when I was a teenager. I became interested in collecting when I was very young. And there was a small shop on 50, 54th Street or 5th Avenue in New York City. It's a place that I visited often. The owner was a warm, kind man with an accent that reminded me of my grandparents. One afternoon, I went in and asked him if he had anything by Egon Schiele. He went upstairs and came down with a beautiful watercolor by Schiele. I loved it. I asked him if he had any others. He paused for a moment and then gave me a strange look with an almost embarrassed smile and a slight shrug of his shoulders. And he said, once I had more Sheila's, but not anymore. I was only 15, but I had enough sense to drop the topic and not ask any further questions. I had forgotten that moment in the shop until many years later, in 1986, I was serving as US ambassador to Austria. I went to see the Mauerbach Monastery outside of Vienna. The old monastery, built in the 17th century, had been used to store Nazi stolen art. Most of the monastery was now empty. As I walked down the long corridors, I came across a room that still haunts me. There on the floor were piles of empty frames, frame after frame after frame. Their contents long since vanished. And my mind went immediately back to that kind man in the shop when I was 15 years old and his embarrassed smile. When I asked the simple question, do you have any more Sheila's? No, he didn't have any more. But someone did, and that is why we're here today, to finally solve the long-standing issue that I will grant you is complicated and difficult. It is filled with good intentions, but there is also greed, intransigence, and extremely la an extreme lack of sensitivity towards the victims. You have the entire panorama of human emotions tied up in the return of art. 
that was stolen from Jews by the Nazis beginning in 1933 and continued, and, and they continued. They also denied its return to the rightful heirs since 1945. As a collector and a Jew, this upset me greatly. So I created the Commission for Art Recovery in 1997, which has been the prime mover in restoring art, restoring art. 20 years ago, I was present when this document, oh, it's here, the Washington Principles, was endorsed by 42 countries. These principles set up the most logical and best framework so far for the return of art that was stolen from Jews. The Washington Principles don't tell countries how to work out the legal details of return, because every country has a different legal system. Instead, the principles encourage countries to find Jewish art in their museums, their institutions, and private collections that were stolen by the Nazis. The principles provide a logical framework that every country can adopt and should have adopted. As I said, 42 countries endorsed it, and yet, here we are 20 years later, and much of this stolen art is still kept from the rightful owners. In most every country in Europe, there are different reasons that this has happened. But in the end, it all comes down to one issue. Justice has been denied. And because of that, the old ghosts of World War II won't go away. Let me give you a brief rundown of some of the European countries and how they have dealt with stolen art. In France, after the war, 60,000 artworks came back, of which 15,000 went unclaimed. Of those, France gave 2,000 of the best works to its museums and sold all the rest. For 20 years, France has not been able to figure out who owns those 2,000 works in their museums which is interesting somehow. The auction house Christie's can review 100,000 pieces every year, but France cannot figure out 2,000 pieces in 20 years. The previous Minister of Culture told us she wants to return all stolen works. I hope that the new minister who took office a few weeks ago will continue to pay attention to this matter and finally do the right thing. However, in France, a new law called the deaccession law should be passed, which would finally help claimants get their Nazi era looted art back. Hungary. Hungary has spent years and a lot of taxpayers' money fighting the heirs of the Herzog family that own a prominent collection. There are 44 works of art owned by the Herzogs in Hungary's museums. The trial has gone on now for 19 years. There is absolutely no question that they belong to the Herzogs, yet Hungary has not and will not take responsibility for what happened. The property of the Jewish citizens, in the end, I believe, the courts will decide in favor of the Herzog family. The case is that clear cut, and Hungary should spare itself the embarrassment of losing this case and giving back the paintings now and get credit for doing the right thing. Everyone, especially Hungary, will be better off in the end. In the Netherlands, which was once very responsible and took the moral high ground on this issue, things have sadly changed. The Dutch have argued that if a painting was sold by the owner, then it was not stolen. But in reality, the owners had to sell their works to survive. Now the Netherlands also say it must examine 
who has a greater interest in a work? The museum that has illegally possessed it for decades or the claimant who was denied possession of the work? I realize the museum grew attached to the work over the decades, but let me remind you, these works were stolen. In the United States, if a person is holding a stolen object, he is just as guilty as the thief who grabbed it in the first place. Nazi looted art in Europe should be no different. Poland has been fighting the return of all the art taken from its museums after the war, which was certainly a crime. But when anyone questions the stolen art taken from Jews and hanging in Polish museums, things are different. Then Poland says, time has run out for anyone to claim them. The question is, who set up this arbitrary clock? Spain. Spain decided that since it was neutral during the war, it's not responsible for doing the research to find out which works of art ended up in Spanish museums during and after the war. In 1995, the Thyssen-Bohr Mises Museum acquired an entire collection which included stolen works. Spain is fighting to keep a Pizarro painting owned by the Casero family and has been fighting it for 13 years. And let's not forget Switzerland, where the museums and art dealers still hold the opinion they were helping the fleeing Jews when they conveniently took the art off their hands and made a great deal of money doing so. The prime example of this is the auction gallery Fisher that sold looted art during and after the war. Some of this art is still in Switzerland. I'm happy that two years ago, the Swiss government began providing funds to identify looted art so that it can be given back to the rightful owners. But at the same time, private art dealers should finally open their archives as well and come clean. In my country, the United States, I lobbied for Congress to pass the HERE Act, which makes it easier for claimants to make their case by eliminating the statute of limitations. But lower courts in the U.S. has set up roadblocks for individuals to sue other governments for return of stolen works. If you've seen the film, The Woman in Gold with Helen Mirren, you saw a vivid example of these court cases. In the case of the Norton Simon Museum in California, two paintings, Adam and Eve by Lucas Cronach was held up in the U.S. courts for years over new technicalities. All of this shows that there's still problems today over stolen art in the U.S. as well. And finally, the one country that bears the greatest responsibility, Germany. Since 1945, I believe it would be hard to find a more responsible country than Germany on so many different fronts. Your behavior, your commitment to Holocaust awareness is exemplary and should be followed by all nations. I think the problems that have arisen in regard to return of Nazi looted art are more institutional than personal. State Minister Grutters is a perfect example of someone with the best of intention but who is constantly blocked by a frustrating federalism and bureaucracy. Just a few days before this conference, Minister Gruders called on all parties involved to finally solve this issue, and I was delighted to hear this. After the discovery of the Gerlitt collection in 2014, Germany showed a strong commitment to push for restitution, but too often we have seen countries only reaching to events, only reacting to events like the Gurlitt, instead of initiating the process on their own before such things are discovered and get the media's attention. 
It was very unhelpful when Dusseldorf first canceled an exhibit of Max Stern and then re reinstated it under pressure while also holding up restitution cases. There is also a problem with German auction houses that still sell their works throughout Europe without proper providence. In some cases, they sell looted works and the purchaser gets a clean title. This is plain and simply laundering art. The most important step would be and must be the total transparency of all museum collections. And in our age, that means digitalization. We need this with all public archives as well. That is why I've initi initiated the Jewish Digital Cultural Recovery Project, which will make all the relevant archival information accessible to anyone. I'm sure there are officials and researchers that have done and continue to do the right thing. But you have a system stuck in a Byzantine bureaucracy. If all levels of government make the real priority, Germany could actually solve this issue. As an example, there are over 5,000 museums throughout Germany that must answer to the laws of each of the 16 lender or municipalities. Every one of these museums must open up its archives and put all its works online with their providence history for the public to see at the very least. If there is just one stolen work in each museum, which is quite possible, plus all the other institutions throughout the country, we are talking about many thousands of pieces that are still hidden. Research has only just started at about 10% of museums and institutions and has already produced thousands of returns. It should not be 10%, it should be 100%. Let me address the German claims process. You have the Lost Art Foundation and the Limbach Commission. In 15 years, the Limbach Commission has looked down, has looked at 15 claims. That's one claim every year. The last two years they had no claims. This is not a very impressive record. It was started with the best of intentions, but it's badly designed and it hasn't really accomplished what it set out to do. While well, I understand the political balancing act that placed the Lost Arts Foundation in Magdeburg, it shows that the government did not make this a priority. Add to that, the current makeup of the Limbach Commission does not reflect the necessary expertise in international balance that would make the commission a trusted form to bring a claim. The commission needs a total redesign and it needs to be staffed with more people who have vision and commitment. I believe that is how Germany will move ahead and finally solve the issue once and for all. Finally, I cannot force a country to give back what was stolen. I cannot force you to address the issue with a vision to solving it. I cannot force every single museum to put all of its art online with relevant providence information. I cannot force you to create a comprehensive pan-European database to help rifle owners find their artworks. All of this has to come from you. It must come from every country in Europe and beyond. If you believe me that our, your intentions are really good, then you really want to do the right thing. Then you must des deliver the results. Open your museums and provide real advice to your museums and really help the victims in pursuing their cases. Help them break down the roadblocks that have stopped them for the past decades. We have heard the right, we, we have heard the term, do the right thing. You know, I believe there's an added benefit to doing the right thing. Everyone will feel better when a stolen object is returned to its rightful owners. This goes directly to the strongest virtues of our Judeo-Christian foundation. We teach our children right from wrong when they are small. 
We do this because we know it is one of the major building blocks of our civilization. We all have that responsibility. You, here in Germany especially, have the responsibility to do the right thing. So your children and their children will not have to continue to live under this dark cloud. Do it so Europe is remembered for its virtues and do it for that kind art dealer I met when I was 15 years old, who I think is smiling down on us by finally making this right. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Ronald S. Loder. And now Stuart Eisenstadt is getting ready. As I can see, his name has been mentioned previously as well, ladies and gentlemen. He is the architect of the Washington Conference. Stuart Eisenstadt, both lawyer and diplomat. He, in 1998, was one of the founding fathers of the Washington Conference on um, assets of the then time of the Holocaust. He had several important uh, um, jobs in his life. He was e uh, U.S. ambassador at the European Union. He was uh, had various ministerial jobs, wrote books, uh, Incomplete Justice being one of them. Welcome. We are happy to have you with us. Your Excellencies, Ambassador Lauder, Minister Gruters, my partner at the State Department, Tom Yasquetti, representatives of the U.S. Embassy, and friends. I'm deeply grateful for Monica Gruters for initiating and organizing this conference. She is a heroic figure with more still to come. It is, in my opinion, yet another example of Germany's commitment to Holocaust justice and memory. At the outset, I want to acknowledge the indispensable leadership Ambassador Ronald Lauder has provided over the years. And his remarks are all the more reason that it's crucial that we use this specialist conference to launch at the highest political levels the implementation of the Washington principles by all of the 44 countries who adopted them. The Holocaust was not only the most ghastly genocide in human history, it was also the greatest theft. And that theft was not simply an effort to get compensation for the Third Reich by selling artworks and cultural objects and instruments and books. It was an effort commensurate with the Holocaust itself to wipe out all vestiges of Jewish culture. This may be our last opportunity to write in some imperfect way one of the most ghastly crimes in human history before all of the current 400,000 Holocaust survivors around the world breathe their last breath. The impetus behind the Washington Principles, which myself and my colleague who's here, J.D. Bindenagel, helped produce, was never simply to get back expensive masterpieces, although that's what garners press attention. Rather, it was to reconnect families with heirlooms and objects that had a meaning far beyond their fair market, for fair market value. Experts estimate that a staggering 600,000 paintings were stolen, of which 100,000 are still missing, and when you add other effects, they run into the millions. As they crossed the German border coming toward this very city, in 1944 and 1945, a group called the Monuments Men of art experts and historians embedded in the U.S. Army collected tens of thousands, indeed hundreds of thousands, of these looted pieces. 
took them to collection points, and then returned them to the countries from whom they were stolen, being unable in the chaos of war to find the owners, relying on those countries to find the owners in their own countries. This reliance was unfortunately often misplaced, and many of these works were simply incorporated into the public collections of those countries to whom the Western Allies returned them. It was to correct this problem that we launched the Washington Conference 20 years ago, reaffirmed by the Theresen Declaration of 2009, and they'll be in June of 2019, hosted by the Czech government, the 10th anniversary of that declaration. And we have made giant strides toward achieving the goals of identifying, publicizing, restituting, and compensating some of that looted art, cultural objects, and books. But we must candidly confront the unfulfilled promises we solemnly made. A fair assessment of the Washington principles is that the glass is half full, but that is not satisfactory. It's time for one last push to co correct the flaws in implementing the Washington principles, both in my own country, in the United States, and throughout Europe, who still have Nazi looted art in their possession. With the assistance of a digital technology we knew nothing of at the Washington Conference 20 years ago. There is no excuse for failing to have the widest distribution of information about Nazi looted art and cultural property. No museum, state controlled or private, no art gallery or collection, no auction house, no private owner should want to hold onto or deal in Nazi looted art stripped in the most violent way from its owners. Every nation that committed to the Washington Principles should recommit themselves today, along with the Theresen Declaration, to redouble their efforts to identify, publish, restitute, or compensate, or find other just and fair solutions when an owner or heir has a legitimate claim. Let me first review the successes of the Washington Principles, the first of which is a profound change in the way the entire art world does its business. There is now a greater recognition that before someone buys or sells any piece of art, it's incumbent that they check their ownership to determine if they pass through European hands between 1933 and 1945. Second. Provenance research has proliferated. Websites are increasingly enabling potential survivors or heirs who may be able to locate their art to be able to do so. And more and more provenance research is being done by non-governmental organizations as well as governments. The pathbreaker was indeed Ambassador Lauder, who established the Commission for Art Recovery a full year before the Washington Principles. And those are now proliferating across Europe and the United States. I welcome the initiative of Ambassador Lauder's Commission for Art Recovery and the Jewish Claims Conference to establish the Jewish Digital Cultural Recovery Project to develop the very database that Ambassador Lauder discussed. The American Alliance of Museums, I'm proud to say, has almost 30,000 works from 179 of its American museums listed on the Nazi-era provenance information portal, admittedly faulty though it is, and we'll discuss that later. In addition, Austria and France, Germany, the Netherlands, and the UK have websites listing suspect art that may have been confiscated by the Nazis, and in 2017, for the first time, the French listed all of its MNR collection. Third, the Washington Principles have, stir have stirred and spurred five European nations to create panels to resolve claims in a non-litigation format as we anticipated at the Washington Conference. 
Germany established its advisory commission called the Limbach Commission in 2013. It has many of the imperfections that Ambassador Lauder mentioned. Importantly, very importantly, in 2016, its membership was expanded to include outside experts. And shortly before this conference, Monica Gruters announced another major welcome reform that could be transformative. And that is, for the first time, the Commission will be able to hear a claimant's argument that it has had its art taken without the approval of the museums funded by the federal government, which had previously been able to block those claims. Indeed, since Monica Gruters has become the federal government's commissioner for culture in the media, there's been a welcome acceleration. She's increased the budget from one to almost seven million euros for museums to be able to afford the difficult work of provenance research. She helped establish the German Lost Art Foundation, which is the sponsor of this conference. And she is beginning to set a standard. The Austrian Restitution Advisory Board has been a model of commitment to restitution. While there are obviously problems with all these, their progress is significant and admirable. The Netherlands created the Dutch Restitution Commission to review claims against the works of art located in their so-called NK collection. That is art forcibly stolen by the Nazis from the Netherlands, taken to Germany, then returned back by the Allies afterward. There's been some backsliding, which I'll talk about momentarily. France, to its credit, undertook a major internal review last year of its handling of cultural property looted during World War II and has just announced that the CIVS Commission, which has done an admirable job of direct Holocaust compensation for French victims of the Holocaust, would be mandated to what they call the mission to address Nazi looted art claims. And I too hope that the new Minister of Culture will continue with the plan of his predecessor to centralize restitution within the mission and provide sufficient financial support. The United Kingdom has a very well-functioning spoliation advisory panel. And yet, even with that, it commissioned Sir Paul Jenkins to conduct an independent review to make sure that they could do more and they are following his recommendations. The Czech Republic has model legislation which enables claimants without any statute of limitations to file claim and a center for documentation to research them. But unfortunately, on paper it looks good. In practicality, there has been too little restitution and hopefully the conference next year will catalyze that. Fourth, international cooperation since the Washington Principles has began to sprout. Germany has funded the German-American Provenance Research Exchange Program for museum professionals along with our Smithsonian Institution. And just last month in Jerusalem, Commissioner Gruters on behalf of the German federal government entered into a memorandum of understanding with the Israeli government in light of their joint cooperation in researching the Gruters art trove and will have it exhibited in Israel in 2019 setting a standard for the exhibition of airless art based upon a temporary loan to Israel. Fifth, there has been in fact, with all the frustrations, with all the frustrations, there has been significant restitution. Austria has restituted over 30,000 cultural objects since the Washington Principles. Germany, 16,000. Just recently, the Netherlands Museum Association announced that 42 Dutch museums had discovered over 170 artworks. Our own AEMD has reported almost 60 cases in which art has been returned or resolved in other ways. And Christie's, the art auction house, has helped resolve some 100 or more claims to art with suspicious World War II provenance given to it for auction or sale since the Washington Principles were promulgated, and Sotheby's has also had 
a good record in this regard. Now, let me address the shortcomings. I helped draft these. I want to be candid about the shortcomings in them. The first, several countries have largely ignored them entirely. Many of the countries that Ambassador Lauder mentioned, and most of these, by the way, not all, but most were victims of the Nazis. We're not suggesting that they looted the art belonging to Jews. What we are saying is that they have in their possession, through the art trade, many of these possessions. And it's incumbent that Hungary and Poland, Spain and Russia, Italy, Romania, and many others, and Latin countries, Argentina, for example, and Brazil, do the provenance research they committed to do at the Washington Principles and in the Theresian Declaration. A second problem is insufficient provenance research and insufficient resources devoted to it. Most key countries simply don't devote sufficient funds, if at all, and human resources to expedite provenance research. And without provenance research, nothing's possible. That is the foundation stone of justice. It's critically important that my country, the United States of America, which was the prime mover in negotiating the Washington Principles, be the exemplar for the rest of the world. But we also have not done as much as we should. Our private museums and virtually all of our museums, except the National Gallery in Washington, are private, are certainly constrained by lack of funds, by the absence of a cadre of researchers, but more broadly, by the low priority they have given to provenance research of Nazi looted art and their collections. I hope that the AAMD and our other American associations will undertake an objective and thorough study of how its member museums have complied with the Washington principles. I know that museum budgets are tight, but a priority should be given to this important moral task. Most museums in Europe have not even started provenance research, and those that have begun are nowhere close to completing them. In France, budgets for archival records appear to be reduced. Moreover, France and the Netherlands share a common issue, and that is most of their research has been done on the MNR collections in France, the NK collections in the Netherlands. That is, again, art taken from those countries into Nazi Germany, returned after the war, and they have not done virtually anything on their other public collections almost nothing. They should devote as much attention to those public collections as they do to their NK or MNR collections. When part of the Gerlitt collection was given to a museum in Bern, Switzerland, they took a very positive and admirable step in giving the German task force that Monica Gruders created to review the bulk of the collections the opportunity to do so. And when I saw for the first time the news of the tax evasion case, I urged, as did the State Department, that this wasn't a tax evasion case. It was the Washington Principles, and they've acted accordingly, and so has the Byrne Museum. There has been some provenance research and restitution by Switzerland, but because so much of the art by those fleeing the Nazis was sold in Switzerland, much more needs to be done. And Switzerland could make an enormous contribution to the Washington principles by opening their private museums and archives and those of their art dealers for accessibility. Many German federal museums have done significant provenance research, but it's very important that there be, and I say this, Commissioner uh, Gruders, a centralized effort to collect all of these together to give us a sense of all the provenance research that's been done the results in identifying problematic art and what remains to be done. A third problem is that several of the European art advisory panels have significant flaws. France, again, to its credit, 
is targeting the CIVS to do this work. But because France has no law permitting the deaccession of artworks from its public museums, the most it can do is provide compensation, even for a completely legitimate complaint. The Netherlands is a puzzle. They had a remarkably enviable record. They were really pathbreakers in returning art and in having a very excellent panel. And yet, very recently, they introduced this concept of a balance of interest, that you balance the emotional attachment of the claimant against the importance of the public museum keeping the art. That's, if I may say so, totally contrary to the Washington principles and contrary to the best of Dutch intentions of what they had done in the past. I welcome again the reforms that Ambassador Gruder is putting on in the German Limbach Commission. And let me say it very clearly. I don't think anybody has negotiated more with Germany on Holocaust issues than I have over 20 years. Billions of dollars of recoveries, both with my US government hat on and for the Jewish Claims Conference. But just as you've so meaningfully done for decades in negotiating compensation for survivors, perhaps, perhaps, the federal German government could also accept responsibility for just and fair solutions, not only in your federal museums, but also in the museums of your lender. And I know the importance that the lender have in this, but this is a unique situation. And at least encourage them in the strongest way to fully abide by the Washington principles. Despite Germany's recognition that the Washington principles apply to private museums as well as public ones, there have been virtually no restitution of Nazi looted art in the hands of private foundations and individuals. Unless German auction houses follow the procedures like Christie's and Sotheby's, we are seeing on a regular basis Nazi looted art being placed on the art market denying survivors or their heirs the opportunity to make claims. On airless art, the question of ownership is indeed very difficult. It's not been sufficiently addressed. And if I may suggest, the German government might reach a mutually agreeable means of handling airless art, that is art where owners can't be identified, perhaps because all the families were wiped out, with Jewish organizations and the State of Israel. The experience of my own country underscores the mixed record in the 20 years since the Washington Conference. We indeed have a unique situation. All of our museums, except the National Gallery, are private. We have a staggering 35,000 museums. Indeed, our Washington principles were influenced by the US-based Association of Art Museum guidelines. There are 179 museums with 29,000 covered artworks in a portal that is designed to allow a potential claimant not to have to go to each museum, but to look at the portal and find out where their art might be. But by their own admission, the AAMD has told me that they have outdated technology and that this whole portal is not as useful as it should be. It's particularly important that that be updated. And one other thing, I saw this with great pain. After such a great start with creating the portal, over the last 10 years or so, American museums lost an appreciation for the moral value of the Washington principles, and in case after case began asserting legal defenses, significantly due to the efforts of Ambassador Lauder, Congress passed the new HERE Act in 2016, which allows claimants to present a case in court after six years from the time the object was located and identified. And that has already, I'm told by the AMD, promoted more settlement of claims outside of litigation. Let me conclude with the following. This conference is entitled 20 years 
Washington principles, but roadmap for the future. So let me give you, in closing, my suggestions for roadmap for the future. First, we now appreciate, as we did not 20 years ago, that confiscation of Jewish and other art was not simply theft. It was broader than that. And here, Germany deserves great credit because its definition sets a standard all countries should emulate, recognizing that much of that confiscation was actually forced sales at bargain basement prices, as Commissioner Gruder has mentioned, and even flight sales of art after people were able to leave but had to leave all their possessions behind, and perhaps they had only that one or two movable pieces of art to be able to sustain themselves in their new country. Germany covers all of these and considers all of these covered. Second, through provenance research of public and private collections, it's important that resources be devoted to them. It's demanding and time consuming, but important. Here, the Netherlands does serve as a model. It's expanded its research, and Germany is also setting a standard by, for the first time, again, another initiative of Monica Gruder's, allowing private collections to receive public government funds in Germany to conduct provenance research if they will follow the Washington principles when they identify Nazi looted art. That is a great breakthrough. Israel will shortly launch a nationwide program of provenance research for their museums and will provide public funding to train provenance researchers with international experts. Third, descriptions of all collections of public museums should be published on accessible websites with accompanying provenance results at the object level. That's where the importance of Ambassador Lauder and the Claims Conferences Initiative comes. Fourth, all states, all states that were part of the Washington Principles and the Theresian Declaration. All states should abide by them. There is simply no excuse in the 21st century for coveting Nazi looted art. It doesn't speak well for those countries when they do so. Fifth, nations should treat all their public collections the same in diligently researching, identifying, and where appropriately restituting or compensating survivors or their heirs. Public collections, therefore, in France and the Netherlands should be treated the same as the French MNR and Dutch NK collections. Sixth, all countries which have Nazi looted art in their public museums should pass deaccession laws to permit them to return confiscated art in their possessions to their rightful owners and to revise their laws to enable private museums to do the same. Seventh, the Washington principles should be honored by private collections and private art trade just as much as public museums. There is an inspiring example of the Dutch royal family when Queen Giuliani, uh, Giuliana uh, unexpectedly had gotten and acquired what she later determined, the royal house determined, was looted art, and she returned it. European nations have not successfully addressed Nazi looted art in private collections. It's being recycled by the private trade and by auction houses here. No private collector or private museum should want to traffic or keep stolen goods, especially Nazi looted art. And here I want to, again, pay special attention because this is a best practice of two large auction houses, Christie's and Sotheby's in New York and in London. They have set a global standard for the private art market. I urge all European art and auction houses to follow. They have full-time staffs. Monica Dugo is here, Lucian Simmons is here, and their staffs, and they have a unique agreement now with their consigners. They simply will not sell anything that's tainted. Christie's has actually published guidelines in this effect, and Sotheby's more informally. This is a template for 
private settlements. They've successfully been able to reach agreements with the consigners on behalf of the original possessor of what turns out to be Nazi looted art and the families. It can be done where the will is there. And I urge European art dealers to follow the example of Christie's and Sotheby's. I also urge our own American Dealers Association to encourage all of its members through their code of ethics to follow the Washington principles. Switzerland has made a good start in regulating their private art market, but it doesn't appear that it applies to Nazi looted art. But the framework is there, and I'm pleased that they're beginning to fund research into their provenance. The AAMD, our own association, has pursued its guidelines for over 240 private museums, and they are finding just and fair solutions done privately and successfully. Eighth, nations with public museums should establish one point of contact to help claimants navigate. We have a Holocaust Claims Office of the New York Department of Financial Services that does this, but it's highly underfunded. Ninth, there should be no time limit on bringing claims if the complete identification and location of the art was not previously known. Then reasonable time limits can be set once the identity and location of the object is known. Tenth, decisions by the national panel should be posted on the internet, the reasons for their decisions given, and translated into several languages so that they can serve as useful guideposts for future action by the other panels. Eleventh, and I say this as a former ambassador to the EU, more engagement by the European Union would be very important while recognizing member states retain sovereignty in cultural areas. There's a very positive development. The Committee on Legal Affairs of the European Parliament just last month has a draft report recognizing at the European level the Washington Conference principles, recognizing that insufficient attention has been paid at the EU level to the restitution of art urging the European Commission to support a cataloging to gather data on looted cultural art across all of their 28, soon unfortunately 27, member states. It calls on member states themselves to make all necessary efforts to adopt measures in favor of Nazi looted art. And 12th at last is airless art. This is directly covered by the Washington principles in name and I know it presents daunting challenges. But with improved databases, more detailed provenance research, more readily accessible genealogical information than we could possibly have imagined 20 years ago, there is a new need to try to locate errors. And if they can't be found, creative solutions can be used, such as using airless art as an educational device through loans to Israel and other countries for exhibition, through displaying, as France does, by the way, when their artworks are done with unknown uh, Jewish families, saying so, so that when a visitor comes and looks at that art, he or she can understand that this was taken as part of the Holocaust. And in some cases, Austria, as a last resort, after all of these have been done, has sold them with the proceeds going to Holocaust survivors. In any event, the ownership of airless Nazi confiscated art was taken from Jews and shouldn't be the current, uh, considered the owners by the current possessors and incorporated permanently and into their collections. We need to have creative solutions between the governments, their Jewish communities, international Jewish organizations, and the state of Israel. In conclusion, this Berlin conference gives us, again, perhaps the last opportunity to get new energy and new momentum behind fulfilling the promises of the Washington Principles. We must not turn our backs on Holocaust survivors and the memory of those who were killed. We must not let history's verdict be one of disappointment that we had the opportunity and we failed to fulfill the commitments made by the Washington Principles and the Theresian Declaration. We've come so far in the right direction in the past 20 years. Now it's time to go the rest of the way, to rise to the challenge. We can do it 
We must do it. Thank you. Many thanks, Stuart Eisenstadt. So now I would like to inform journalists who are taking photographs to tell you that in conference room one, there's a signature of a joint declaration of the implementation of the Washington principles. Stuart Eisenstadt is heading there now, and that will be a photo opportunity for you in conference room one. And while we will continue here, we are going to push lunch back a tiny bit. You may have noticed that we are not quite within our schedule. Gilbert Lupfer has been referred to a number of times since 2017. He has been the head of research and cooperation in the Dresden art collection, and he is going to take stock at this point. You have the floor, sir. Minister of State Grütters. Ambassador Lauder, Ambassador Lauder, Ambassador Eisenstadt, Ambassadors, MPs, Ladies and Gentlemen, Hermann Patzinger, Hermann Patzinger Markus Hilgert, Colleagues, ich darf Sie on behalf of our cooperation partner, let me welcome you to the conference organized by the German Lost Art Foundation together with the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation and the Cultural Foundation of the German Federal States and the Federal Government Commissioner for Culture and Media and kindly hosted by the House of Cultures of the Word World. Sorry. A very warm welcome to our autumn conference, a particularly warm welcome to survivors of the Holocaust who are with us today and the descendants of survivors of the Holocaust. The Autumn Conference of the German Lost Art Foundation have a certain tradition. Let me just remind you of the successful conference in 2017 in Bonn on the art market in Germany, in France rather, under German occupation. And although we find ourselves in an eminently political sphere, and I think that is something that we see when we note that some participants of our conference have just left to sign a political declaration. So although this is an eminently political sphere that we are working in, our conferences have always been specialist conferences and not primarily political events. And this is the case with this one as well, a conference of experts where we will debate in a controversial manner but where we will not forget that we share common binding goals. How could we now touch on the conferences of the two and a half days ahead? Well, first of all, it is the acknowledgement of the epochal making achievements of the Washington Conference. Some of its protagonists are thankly among us. And secondly, it is the constructive, critical reflection of what we have achieved in the past 20 years and where there are still gaps, deficits, and need for improvement. Thirdly, we want to set our sights on the future and naturally, though not only, talk about international connection and networking, more transparency, teaching at universities, turning fixed-term researcher contracts into permanent ones in the area of provenance research, but also involving private collectors and the art trade more. In addition, we also want to critically examine 
how the whole question of art stolen by the Nazis, provenance research, and restitution can be brought more into the center of social discourse than it has been so far, and how we can best reach young people. I would like to draw attention to our workshops on the third conference day, particularly, which are an intrinsic part of the program as a whole, in which questions of exhibiting, of data protection, of communicating these ideas, of seeking heirs, all of these issues will be discussed there. For the German Lost Art Foundation, it is an honor to be the organizer of this major international conference. This role reflects the importance that we have achieved with our work in just a few years, really. In Germany, the Local, regional, and national levels of the government have commissioned us as key point of contact in all questions dealing with lost art, particularly art stolen by the Nazis. We fund, animate, support, advise, and coordinate, always in cooperation with, at times, critical, even demanding partners like the Jewish Claims Conference, who regularly hold up a mirror to the institutions in Germany, the Provenance Research Working Group, in which professional experience of nearly 20 years is gathered, or the work in the libraries or the Central Institute for Art History. Now, I would just like to touch on a couple of points from our wide-ranging area of activity. At the focus is financing projects from public funds that we organize with the support of the Government Agency for Culture and Media, as well as our very committed funding advisory board. And this is an area where I believe we are very successful Every cultural institution in Germany which suspects it may have artworks stolen by the Nazis will be is now put into a position that they are able to investigate this suspicion in a targeted professional manner. More and more institutions are using this option. Increasingly, even small institutions far from the big cities for whom special support offers have been developed. The range of museums has been considerably expanded, and we now specifically target university collections or museums of technology. Private collectors can also be supported since 2017 in provenance research, even though there's certainly a real need to catch up in this area. We have already been successful when it comes to the reconstruction of scattered private collections. An example is the Mossa Art Research Initiative, MARI. This is excellent cooperation of a number of different partners, and we will hear more about this project later. In this case, cooperation with the heirs is essential. And in other connections, it will this cooperation with the heirs will continue to gain significance. Already now, the Foundation is a point of contact and an information center. This is true, on the one hand, for institutions who have identified artworks confiscated by the Nazis and who are now seeking heirs of the original owners. So far, methodical information has been offered at our website, and later they will be able to actually apply for funding to fund the search as well. And what about the former owners or their descendants and heirs? They have often contacted us, and we have been able to offer them advice. This is a service we want to expand. We want to make it easier for all descendants, no matter where they live in the globe, to have an easier initial contact in Germany through us. Another area of activity of the center that is important is the collection, processing, connecting, and dissemination of electronic data. A number of 
components have already been created towards this end. A decisive step forwards is one we expect from a complex research database which will be made available from 2020. But for a moment, allow me first to look back. The art and cultural assets stolen by the Nazi regime had more or less been forgotten, to a large extent anyway, in the 1990s, at least by everyone who wasn't a direct victim of this theft. For museums, libraries, archives, and funding organizations, it was just easier not to critically examine the dark spots or the empty gaps and blanks in their provenances of their collections or to critically engage with the dubious past of some of their former directors. And I think that just waiting for it to go away and ignoring it might have been the stance that might have continued for a very long time. Initial uncertainty was triggered by the opening of Central and Eastern Europe and the unification of the two Germanys. It raised many questions that had not been solved, taboo questions that hadn't been raised since the end of the war, not least around questions about ownership. In the early 90s, for example, in Berlin and in Dresden, there were initial restitutions of stolen artworks, but this start didn't go far enough. We need to admit self-critically that the main impulse did not come from Germany and did not come from another European country either. It did not come from museums or libraries or universities. Far more, it was those who suffered damage by Nazi theft and those who suffered at the hands of the Nazi terror regime itself, their descendants, their heirs, and organizations who were fighting against this forgetting and this silence. It was down to their tenacity that we owe the establishment of the Washington Conference and its declaration. The conference was an important event, and the principles are among the most important international cultural policy documents at the turn of the 20th to the 21st century. But from today's perspective, its effect can hardly be overestimated, but it did not come about immediately. If we look back, again, self-critically, we have to say that it took a number of years until its effect was really felt in Germany and in other countries. The first decade after Washington was defined from tenacious attempts to convince other people and courageous efforts but unfortunately also by reluctance and even resistance. Against this background, we must not underestimate the fact that some museums on their own responsibility started carrying out research and that slowly a network unfolded that we still profit from today and that there were initial results, restitutions, and just and fair solutions. The Magdeburg Coordination Center for Lost Art played an important role in this time, not just as the organization operating the Lost Art database, but also by publishing a series of publications that set standards. It's worth mentioning here the Provenance Research Working Group which comprised a loose con network of a few provenance researchers working as lone fighters, more or less, in the early 2000s, which has now developed into an international advocacy group. An important turning point was 2008, when in Germany the systematic project funding mediated by the new Center for Provenance Research in Berlin enabled or even compelled those institutions to carry out relevant activities who had primarily been silent thus far. 
And this effort was also triggered by the intensely debated case of the restitution of Ernst Ludwig Kirchner's Straßenszene, street scene from Berlin's Brücke Museum. Another turning point took place almost exactly five years ago. It was what became known as the Schwabinger Art Trove, or the Gurlitt case. Not only that the name of the art trader Hildebrand Gurlitt, hitherto only known by specialists, suddenly became a synonym for art stolen by the Nazis. Beyond this, provenance research finally entered the focus of public attention. Although what we often overlook, overlook is that the Gurlitt trove of artworks had nothing to do with museums and that it is therefore not suitable as proof that in museum depots there are thousands of stolen artworks hidden away. What became manifest far more is that in private collections as well and in the art trade, there is a problem with art stolen by the Nazis, even if it perhaps tur may turn out to be the case that the Gurlitt Trove does not contain as much stolen art as was originally assumed. Services offering advice and support for private collectors who want to check the provenance of their collections is something that the organization now offers. The Gurlitt case showed clearly even where the limit, even if you intensely work and try to find out the provenance using international experts, we got a real sense of what the limits are of what can be found out, even if the will is there. However, this was a decisive impulse to create the infrastructure prerequisites for more intensified provenance research. In the early 2015, the German Lost Art Foundation set up the Competent Center in Magdeburg. Within its sphere of expertise was maintaining the lostart.de database, which has proved to be a tool that is used internationally and is indeed crucial in this area. And it works on the assumption of voluntary use and access. But we do get criticism about this, for example, from art dealers who would like to have stricter listing criteria, for example, by heirs of people who have had art stolen from them. Well, the German Loft Lost Art Foundation carries out a plausibility check for every report, but for obvious reasons it is not in a position to take on a complete in-depth research for every artwork. A decision by a court of last resort, the Federal Administrative Court, confirmed the view of the Lost Art Foundation on the character of the database. www.lostart.de remains, very much in the spirit of the Washington Declaration, a low threshold instrument to solve Nazi stolen art crimes. And for 18 years now, it has been continuously further developed and adapted to the fast-changing conditions, particularly digitization. In addition, the German Lost Art Foundation is working intensely on a research database, which not only makes the results of the funded projects in Germany transparent, but also is open for other data and will be linkable to other databases. In a nutshell, a key aid for all who carry out provenance research. So it's about creating more transparency and a greater level of connectedness. But that is not enough. The interpretation of the Washington Principles in 2018 must not question its core, the search for artwork stolen by the Nazis, but it must focus on the interests of the victims of those who had artwork stolen by the Nazis and their descendants. However, in the future, there are additional tasks that it must take on that do not contradict this core. Provenance research needs to aspire to greater public visibility. 
Now, as there are fewer and fewer survivors of the Holocaust still among us, these artworks can become witnesses, and this has an increasing importance. Some museums have already recognized this and are curating exhibitions dedicated to solving cases of Nazi art crime. And just how successful such exhibitions can be and the large amount of public interest they can get can be seen just a few hundred meters from here in the Martin Grobius building, the exhibition on the Gurlitt case. But all of this is not enough. The question of provenance, of the origins of these arts must be integrated far more in our knowledge transfer and civic education work as well, not least to respond to worrying current anti-Semitic and historical revisionist trends in Germany, but also in other countries. How can this issue, which is so essential for our historical and social understanding of ourselves, be best communicated to young people? This is a question that plays an important role in the conference and in its workshops. And with the Kerber Foundation, we have found a good partner to address these issues. Working together with the Jerusalem Declaration as well, of, we feel that this declaration from October of this year calls clearly for there to be greater public awareness about this destruction of culture and theft of artworks. Perhaps there's just one last aspect I can touch on before I conclude. The German Lost Art Foundation in January 2019 is going to take on a new area of responsibility, the funding of provenance research in the colonial context. You be assured that this will in no way be done at the expense of our core mandate, solving crimes of Nazi art confiscation in the spirit of the Washington Declaration. All together with the Commissioner for Culture and Media, all of the necessary financial personnel and organizational requirements have been met. For example, setting up a new department and the financing from a separate budget title for this. And finally, all of the employees of the Lost Art Foundation will be made available to this end. And we must also be aware of the fact that having a wider mandate will actually strengthen the Lost Art Foundation as an institution. So now all that remains is for me to wish three exciting, productive, and argumentative days as well, in which, despite all of our different views of things and individual issues, we should not lose sight of the fact that we're all here for the same reason, with the same interest, to debate and to reflect on how we can shed light on Nazi art theft crimes and how we can intensify our efforts ensure a even stronger long-term basis in all of society. I thank you. Thank you very much, Hubert Lupfer. And so that we can continue with our debate refreshed, we will now take lunch down in the restaurant and in the Hirschfeld bar. And I'd like to ask you to be back here at 2.30, where we will be listening to Benedict Savoir's talk.